Your Humanities Half Hour is brought to you by the Northern Marianas Humanities Council, navigating the human experience together. Hafadé, Tiro, and welcome to Your Humanities Half Hour. I'm Catherine Perry, and today we are looking back in time to the Spanish era here in the Marianas uh, when Spain was the administrator of these islands. And here to give us a little bit of a glimpse into that period of time is Carlos Madrid. He is a uh, the professor of Pacific Spanish Pacific history and also the director of research for Micronesian Area Research Center at the University of Guam. No stranger to our show. Carlos, welcome back. Thank you, Catherine. How have you been? Fantastic. It's always good to be back to, to Saipan. It's great to see old friends, new friends, and see the, the, the creativity that is going on. There's, there's a lot of things going on in Saipan right now, and I'm really thrilled to be here. Well, it's nice to have you here because I know that whenever you're here, there's something good brewing. Uh, <laughs> so we're excited for whatever you have going on. But that's not what we're going to talk about today. No, that's always good to be back. Um, to me, coming back to Saipan is a little bit coming back home. So uh, it's, it's always a pleasure. And thank you for having me, really. Well, I'm excited because, you know, um, the Spanish administration was such a huge part of our history here in the Marianas. We still see the ev evidence today, but we don't really go back and talk a lot about what the times were like, what was going on, and you're the perfect person to do that. So thanks for your time. No, oh, well, thank you. Um, but I, I think you have a point, I know what you mean. And um, I, I, for such a long period of our history, or the history of the Mariana Islands, it, there's so much information to uncover, to know. And uh, from the University of Guam and uh, from Mark, in collaboration with uh, CNMI partners, we're also trying to promote the idea of or some, some kind of training for younger scholars, for local scholars, to do what I do, which is archival research, going through the documents, extracting the information that is uh, embedded in the writings of the reports, the letters, uh, written either in the 1600s, the 1700s, and the 1800s, just to talk about the, the Spanish times. But even in the 1900s, if we were to say about the German times or the Japanese. But as far as the Spanish times is concerned, it's exactly as you mentioned. There is a lot of information to to uncover, to know, and there is, and we need that to have, to be in a local perspective. Uh, me, I have the facility of the language. I can read in Spanish. I can decipher the documents. I can interpret it. Mm -hmm. But it always is going to need uh, um, a local perspective, mm -hmm. uh, and in that sense, capacity building and the training of those among the community that are really interested into these things and, and realize of the potential that it has, uh, can be trained. And at the OG, at the University of Guam, at the uh, Micronesian Studies uh, Program, for example, or at the Micronesian Research Center, we're looking forward to provide opportunities to whoever is interested in doing this kind of work. Um, there, just to give you um, a sample, there, there are two periods of history in the 1800s alone that are very significant for Saipan in particular, but for the Marianas in general. And those two periods, we could argue they're like the 1850s and then the 1890s, uh, framed by two events that happened around those times in the 1850s, 1856, the smallpox epidemic that, that we all know about. There was a massive epidemic in the islands and it took the lives of about one third, more than one third of the population. Uh, it was a traumatic event also for the people who survived. Because you see reference of it in documents later on by Spanish officers or Chamorro um, writing letters to their family, mentioning, always referring to the epidemic as one of the most uh, traumatic experiences. To match it with co our contemporary times or recent history, it's similar to how the people refer to World War II mm. here in, wow. in Saipan, that kind of intense um, effect and traumatic uh, effect. So that's one period, I think the 1850s, and 
another one that we were saying is the 1890s could be, no? in anticipation of that colonial partition of the Marianas that was triggered by the war between the United States and, and Spain, that they were fighting for Cuba. But then the, the echoes of that war implied uh, that uh, the, the Spanish giving up sovereignty of the Northern Mariana Islands in favor of Germany in, in, a, in, a, in a colonial transition of power in which the local authorities or the local residents didn't have any, any saying. But the 1890s, right before that was about to happen, it was a time of growth in Saipan and of change and of, um, I guess we could say, like crystallization of a society, that community of um, Chamorro and Refalawa settlers living in more or less the same uh, territory and, uh, and the, the new modern times of steamers, new businesses, um, new regulations, uh, new opportunities for people for, for trade and commerce. So these are two periods of our history that, as you mentioned, we know very little about and it's worth knowing more about it. Well, I'm happy that you're uh, able to, based on your uh, long experience in studying the Marianas and everything you've read kind of, uh, well, I'm hoping that you'll make these two periods come alive for us today, starting with, as you said, the 1850s. What was life like here in the Marianas? What was going on? What were the major things happening? Well, this uh, um, uh, the more we go into those um, the years of the mid 1800s, the more fascinated one gets because it's a, it, it was also a time of change. The the islands at the time they were as distant as distant and far away as they were ever from their metropolis, from the colonial metropolis. That it was no longer New Spain or Mexico as we call it today, but at that time New Spain. It was no longer there. Mexico became under a republic. Uh, the Spanish didn't have the Americas anymore. So the colonial metropolis of the Northern Marianas was Madrid. Wow. And it took six months to go from Spain to the Philippines alone in those years. We're talking 1830s to the 1860s. So in the 1850s, what we're finding is a community of um, indigenous uh, Chamorro who have moved back from Guam to the Northern Marianas, to Saipan in particular, to, to be precise, um, either by making, uh, applying for it to the, to the government in Nagaña or, or by being sentenced, being somehow exiled to, to live in, to, to populate uh, Saipan. What the Spanish administration was trying to do at that time was to repopulate the islands because of the, the collapse of, of uh, the demographic collapse that uh, was suffered in the 1600s because of the war and the epidemics, Spanish Amor Wars and, and the epidemics. So in these 1850s, what we find is that policy of repopulating is taking shape already. There, there has been a number of uh, Refalawas communities living, settling in the Marianas by, um, in Saipan by um, authorization of the governor in, in Guam. And in fact, that governor of the 1850s, which was um, 1856 to 1855 to 1866 uh, was a, quite a remarkable governor, uh, de la Corte, governor de la Corte, Felipe de la Corte, and he left uh, a very detailed um, report about the islands, the history, just to give you a sample. No, then I think our audiences will find it interesting. He mentions, and it's also a glimpse on how do we analyze colonial documents because they're always told. These are administrative reports that they have their own agenda, their own priorities. Mm -hmm. They are not describing, there's not an anthropological account. Yes, yes. It's just a very specific, you know, they're sending a letter. Yeah, claro, they're, report. Yeah. Claro, they may be bitter about something, they're hiding other things. So we need to read in between the lines. But one of these um, references of Governor de la Corte in his report about Saipan in particular, because he made that trip to each of the islands, he mentions, you know, those stories about some. Uh, some islanders having escaped the reduction, having escaped in the 1600s, the policy of the Spanish at the time of concentrating the residents into villages. Uh, he said that belief that some of them didn't didn't go and they they escape and they they have been living in Saipan. Those stories have to be deemed unreliable and it's not true. It's not really. I, I found no evidence of it, etc., etc. Cetera, et cetera. So that's a very interesting reference because if he's addressing it, 
is because he heard that story. Mm -hmm. And the way he addresses, if you read in between the lines, he's making an emphasis of it. So we could, and again, with history, it's always hypotheses and but we're tentatively. You could imagine he heard it about it more than once. That's why he's insisting mm -hmm. that he found no evidence. Mm -hmm. We could believe like there was evidence and he didn't find it. Maybe, maybe there were tomorrows that were living here as, uh, you know, uh, as escape free, free yeah. from colonial governance. Mm -hmm. mm, it could be true that they were just stories, but there were no basis for it. Mm -hmm. That's also a possibility. Or what I believe that is in maybe by the 1850s when De La Corte was here, it was no longer true. It was no longer like that, but it had been like that mm. because by the 1850s, the, the Spanish administration was already like almost um, over 150 years old. So there has been a lot of time that had passed. Maybe there was a community or a number of people that escaped the reduction uh, and ran away from it and, and lived in Saipan uh, either in a, as a community or separately or in the jungle or etc. But that's a, that's a, a significant consideration for, for example, archaeologists to have in mind when they explore the archaeological strata, what do they find? It was from historic periods, from prehistoric periods. Well, they may be finding, they could find, if this reference of Governor de la Corte was true, they could be finding um, testimonies of life the way it was in pre-colonial times, but finding it in colonial times, which, I mean, that's found regardless of, of this instance, because some of the practice, most of the practices actually continued and the tools and the resources. But they may be, this is one sample of, of, um, of those uh, instances in which um, archival references can help us extract evidences of something that otherwise it will not be clear. We don't have any other knowledge mm -hmm. of that phenomenon happening of that, you know, the possibility of tomorrow's living in Saipan uh, freely after the, the, con the Spanish conquest. We don't find it unless we do a, um, and this kind of a scrutiny of the written document. Mm -hmm. What kind of governor was de la Corte? That's, uh, that's, uh, uh, that's an interesting question, Catherine. The, he, he was quite a um, remarkable man. He was trained as an engineer. He was uh, almost like a general, so a higher ranking than, uh, than most of the governors, which were lieutenant colonel. Um, and he was highly educated. He he was um, he stayed here longer than any other governor. He stayed I think you said eleven years. Eleven years, yeah. which normally was supposed to be three. Wow. He also went through um, he, uh, the, the the period of history of that smallpox epidemic that we we're mentioning the year after his arrival, eighteen fifty six, oh. and that was also a, a, a changing time for 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 the Marianas. Um, just to give you a sample, last year uh, on on how. We're still uncovering unknown documents that have to do with our history. There was this family in, in Spain that had their, their descendants of a Filipina in the 1850s, a Filipina who was married to a Spanish officer. And that Spanish officer was, married, uh, was posted in the Marianas during the 1850s, during the smallpox epidemic. Mm -hmm. And this Filipina lady, her name, I don't remember right now, she, she wrote a diary of her life, her personal diary. And she describes a lot of things that are um, that fall below the radar of the colonial administrators because they, they are handling other stuff. Like what kind of things? Well, more you know, it, it's it, the interest of her writing is triple because she's a woman, mm -hmm. which she will focus on other things that are different than men. Um, uh, she was also Filipina, uh, which she was not. She was Spanish trained or educated, but she was from from a different background mm -hmm. than the colon uh, than the colonizers. And um, and it's also she's also writing her personal diary. So there's no she's just writing what is on her mind. And she writes, for example, on wedding ceremonies that uh, that she witnessed from the villages, meaning to say from the from the Chamorro Chamorro, as opposed to the mestizo Chamorro of Hagaña. Mm -hmm. In Hagaña, they're more Spanish mestizo Chamorro mestizo. In the villages in Rota, in in Saipan, in the in the Guam villages. Uh, there are more uh, tomorrow, tomorrow, and she describes uh, surprising or strange uh, celebrations for wedding. She mentions, for example, um, 
let me see if I can recall the, the, the day before the wedding. There, there is like a parade of the the the, the bride of the, um, and the groom and the and the families uh, parading towards the church you know, on the street. And in front of it, opening the the parade, mm -hmm. there is a character. There is someone dressed in extravagant features, like a not like a monster, but a like a deformed or a, or an Awkward. Exaggerated or yeah, yeah, something. I don't remember. We will have to analyze the terms. I, I just read it in passing. Uh, but yeah, like a like a um, scary character or a strange character. Uh, with a person impersonating this mm -hmm. character with a with a cane, and the diary says reciting verses in Chamorro, so old that nobody remembers. What do they mean, really? Wow. Yeah. So there are these are uh, instances of cultural practices that are encoded in documents that unless we're actively looking for those with a local perspective, we're, we're, they're going to go over our head, we're, we're going to miss it. And so this goes to say to somehow summarize this part of, 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 of whatever we're trying to, to convey is that they're more beyond archaeological excavations and the review of the hi history books. There is a still below that there is a still deep, deep, deep amount of information that needs to be mined out, that mm -hmm. has to be extracted. And I know in the community here in Saipan, there's a lot of people, there's a number of people that they're interested in this and they have been working on, on, on this for, for years. And one that comes to mind um, needs no introduction will be Herman Leon Guerrero. Uh, he, he's a, a genealogist and he makes extensive use of these documents and he self-trained himself to, to decipher the documents, to interpret it. And he, he could also attest to what I say of how much information still needs to be uncovered. This uh, Governor de la Corte is one of the instances of a uh, hardworking governor making positive um, uh, improvements for the community, even in, in that colonial setting, because any colonial setting by definition is, is toxic, no? It, it's, it, it's based on a on a, on a brutal yeah. you know, uh, imbalance of power. But uh, within those limits, the, the work of the La Corte, y you could say it was really remarkable. And in fact, other documentary references to be found in archives confirm that the people of the Marianas held him in high regard still 40 years later after he left. They were still referring to him. He was still, they were still making reference to him as the um, there's an idiom that is used that is the, the um, somehow like the, the, the person who lobby for them, mm. the person who lobby in Manila or among with the Spanish, the, the person who lobby for the Chamorros among the Spanish was governor de la Corte. And not all, all the governors were like that. It's like with the German governors or the Navy, American governors, there were different during the Spanish times, it was the same thing. There's some of the governors were. Uh, incompetent, some of them were more dedicated, some of them were incompetent, uh, I mean, more competent but not dedicated. And that showed how the, the Chamorro people negotiated and reacted to those, that uh, pressure that they never went away. Um, de la Corte was one of the good ones, but there, there were other awful uh, governors. What are some of the major accomplishments of de la Corte's governorship? Pues, Mira, yeah, that's, that's also a, a great question because one would be somehow navigating how the epidemics happen. He had to take tough decisions. For example, uh, one of the villages of Guam, uh, Pago, the, the beautiful Pago Bay, uh, was one of the oldest villages, colonial villages in, in Guam. But during the epidemic, um, the surviving families were very few very, very few, most of them had died. This diary that I was just telling you, Catherine, she mentions one instance that during the epidemics, uh, they will see, because only those who were not vaccinated were dying. The people who had been vaccinated, they were okay. Mm. So what you encounter is uh, two societies, the ones that are okay, and uh, the others who are dying, and there's nothing nobody can do about it. And they will say, they will make, the diary makes reference to to children that are wandering alone on the jungle because their family has died and they're just alone and there's nobody, they find somebody, a, a little kid who fell into a hole and died or, or died of starvation after a few days. So they are uncovering a lot of um, um, 
dramatic instances that uh, we still need to study. But I'm, I'm diverging from what you were asking me. The landmark of it, how the governor de la Corte navigated that uh, period, that's one uh, highlight. And, and to see how it also, um, we are hypothesizing, we're working on the idea that it may have triggered the, the facilitated or, or make it easier for people to, back, to be vaccinated. Because initially and traditionally, it was very, I mean, worldwide, people was very hesitant to be vaccinated because it's kind of counterintuitive. Like you're going to get wound at that time, they will have to scratch in the arm and then in inject with a, with a needle or with a, with a little knife the, mm. the virus. So, you know, it's counterintuitive. And, and I'm, I think this governor somehow set the foundation for for the vaccine to be understood better and for the Spanish to, to, to duplicate their efforts and to bring in the vaccine to the Marianas. But that was also a complicated process. The vaccine had to be alive. And it, uh, in fact, the vaccine only succeeded in the, in the 1870s, still took a while. And, but from then on, it, it, it caught on and there were designated vaccinators in every village, Chamorro vaccinator, uh, that is somehow a strain into, mm -hmm. in, into conducting these uh, mm -hmm. vaccines. So those aspects, I think, responding to your, to your question in this long uh, detour, there will be like the writing of the report of the La Corte, which uh, became a book in, in Spain, and the, um, his management of the epidemic, and also the policy in, in befriending and not antagonizing the people that he was governing, which is the, the, the Chamorro people and the people of the Mariana Islands. So I think those are the, the highlights of his 11 year old term. I, um, what about public education? Did he um, help educate the Chamorros um, and the other governors or? Yes, actually, this is uh, one of the most uh, remarkable aspects of, of those times and who had a long effect for, for the people of Saipan, Rota, Tinian and Guam especially in Guam, um, the law that made public education universal, compulsory, and free was made in Spain in the 18, 1857. There was education since before, but it was not what we understand today, this modern sense of universal, free. Everybody gets it. Exactly, yeah. and uh, with a curriculum. And yeah. So 1857, it, and it applied, you know, in those times, the Philippines, and the, they were considered like provinces of Spain. but. In, in a colonial standing, which is in a, in a subjugation standing, a subjugated standing. Um, but being a province, that meant that the law applied for the whole nation. So in five years, 1863, the law for public education was implemented in the Philippines. And de la Corte, who was already serving here uh, as governor, he, he implemented the law uh, as well. So he created what we would call the, the public education um, branch of the government of the Marian Islands. Our wow. public education, we could argue, is older than any other nation in the Pacific, That's like literally. How is that re received by the um, Chamorros and Carolinians at that time? That's something that we, I'm, I'm still working on it because it's uh, it's a long process, but um, takes more digging. Uh, exactly, <laughs> exactly, and that's where we, where we need help. And if there are people in the community that is interested in this kind of thing. It, we guarantee that it will be fascinated. Um, th it, there must have been a range we, we, from, I will assume, um, most likely rejection. Number one, because it was, it's an, it was, it took the shape of an obligation that you need to take your your. This is we're talking of primary education, no? From five to eleven, from six to twelve, more or less, years old, and learn learn to read to write. And uh, I think in English you guys say it, integers, no? Um, integers. Integers. Yes. The four, you know, addition, multiplication. Mm -hmm. So that's the education that it was going to be uh, provided, along with Christian doctrine and I think also like kind of manners, grammar, that kind of thing. And uh, the people may have felt if it was a law requiring, you know, from four hours a day your kid has to go to school and uh, must have had some resistance. Uh, but also there may have been people who realized of uh, the advantage of learning how to read and write or sign their names for, you know, addressing the government, signing contracts, etc. 
So there must have been a, a range of realities from, there, we also know that there were people, the, the community in, for example, in Agadnia, in Agadnia, they were advocates for, the, for this and they were lobbying the governor or whoever governor was, or pushing the government for improving the infrastructures, the school. Every village had a school, Garapan had a, one school, or two schools, one for boys, one for girls. Uh, Rota had another one. Um, in Tinian, there was a little one that may have been working in, uh, and at intervals. And in Guam, the same thing. Every every village had two schools. And uh, in Agaña, there were, of course, the larger school, the San Juan de Letran school, that, 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 that was for, for somehow more detailed education, not higher education, but a little bit higher and also professional training. Mm -hmm. So the, yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating time for, of, of change for the people of, of the Marianas at the time. And moreover, if we keep into account that the instructors themselves were tomorrow as well. Wow. And the Governor de la Corte, going back to what you mentioned, it, 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 he made um, a reference on um, they, they should learn to read and write in Chamorro first. So he made mandatory that Chamorro, and that's when Chamorro became the widespread written language, because it was already the wi wi wow. widespread spoken language. But yeah, those are some of the highlights, I, I would say. Very good. Well, we're chatting today with Carlos Madrid about a couple of periods from the Spanish administration of the Marianas, and we'll be back with more after this break. Half a day, Zantiro. I'm Leo Pangilinan with the Northern Marianas Humanities Council. We'd like to take a moment to thank our generous sponsors who have made possible the many programs in our community like this show. We couldn't have done it without them. And if you value the work we do and would like to make a contribution to our efforts, we ask that you consider making an in-kind or cash contribution to the Northern Marianas Humanities Council. Any amount is appreciated, and donations of up to $5,000 qualify for an educational tax credit. We appreciate your partnership and support. Sizus maasi, olomai, and thank you. Welcome back to your Humanities Half Hour. Carlos, that was, I mean, when you look at De La Corte, he really did a lot, but a lot of the governorships or the governors were not that great. You also wanted to talk about kind of the period and what was going on in the 1890s, right, you said? Yes. What was that like? Well, it, 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 will, it will be a, a completely different period. I mean, for, for the population of, of the Marianas, um, the times have changed. Economically, for example, there was no longer the, um, the whaling trade. There oh. were about 40 to 60, between 30 to 60 ships that used to stop in the Marianas every year. Yeah. So that, that Why? Why no more? Because the, the, the um, whaling industry went through a decline in the 1870s. There were new products. There, were, there was a decrease in oh. the demand of the, okay. of the market. And um, so there was no longer, they were no longer passing by. So there's a, an economic um, stagnation. People have less uh, opportunities for, for improvement. And some of the governors, one, for example, um, uh, Angel de Pazos in uh, 1884, we don't know much about his term because he just um, arrived in Guam and but two months later, the Chamorro Sentinel, the guard in front of the entrance of the palace, the government palace in Hagatnya, shot him. And, and after two months after two of months. being governor. Right. Wow, he must have. What did he do? That's the thing. That's the thing. <laughs> it's a, that's Is a, it in one of the reports? No, because guess what? <laughs> the, the, the trial, of course, there was a trial later on, and in, but the trial is missing. It's nowhere to be found. It's nowhere to be found. So somebody didn't want to know what he did. Which it happened. I, 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 that's what yeah, I was No, no, that, that's, that, that's a possibility. It, it, or maybe it's lost, or maybe we haven't found it, but it's somewhere in a drawer and we haven't found it. <laughs> but so far, it doesn't show up, and it seems like they were they wanted to cover it up, but we don't know. Well, all we know is that the previous governor, before uh, Pathos, yes, had been an awful governor, oh. uh, Brochero. In fact, the Spanish removed him. They were like a, you know, they, they, the the people sent complaints. Oh, wow. uh, they they were and, and Chamorros were they were Spanish nationals, and they, they could write now. 
Uh, they were writing, and I mean, they, they, they could always articulate their, their responses, right? But but by that time, as you were saying, they were like more uh, politically conscious, okay. and, and and they were, the, you know, the complaints reached Manila, and the governor was removed, and there were reports saying, like, you know, the, this man was so awful. Uh, but then two months later, the next governor comes, and uh, and he seem he seems to have insulted as he entered. This is at 8 p.m. Imagine one evening in Hagania in 1884, just a, a regular walk. The governor enters the palace, and as he crosses, uh, the soldier, his name was uh, Jose de Salas, he turned around and shot his, his uh, Remington rifle into, into the governor, killing him instantly. Uh, Chamorros had extraordinary marksmanship with, uh, with rifles. Oh. Extraordinary. Like a, like comes from all that sling stone sling. Exactly, thing. most likely. Yeah, see, you, 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 you <laughs> okay. made the connection because that's exactly what it must have been. Uh, but yeah, he, he died instantly. And the first inquiries, they were because it, it was a, a surprise. That never happened, and it didn't happen anywhere else in the Philippines either. Like, it's really... Um, so you, you can grasp how, how fed up the, the situation may have been for the soldiers mm -hmm. uh, at that time, or for that soldier in particular. Mm -hmm. So what happened to this soldier? The soldier, um, he w th there are two versions of what happened, because we don't really know. The, 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 the Spanish were trying to figure it out. Also, the, 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 the people of Hagania, like what happened. Mm, there is the local version, the, the, the Chamorro version, we call it, that was described by uh, Father Jose Palomo, Paleenco, okay. who was uh, also a priest here in Saipan, huh? or... Um, the Spanish accounts, or the Spanish officers say what happened. Okay. What do you want to hear? First? Both, of course. Okay. It was, uh, this, uh, gover um, Father Palomo mentioned it was just the act of one individual. It was just Jose de Salas. He was the only one who killed him. But under torture, he was interrogated, and under torture, he implicated three other soldiers. Oh. Okay. The Spanish accounts, they say, no, at, at first they mentioned it, it all started because of an insult. The, the governor passed, it seems that he insulted the soldier, and the soldier responded like that. Mm -hmm. But the, the Spanish accounts, they said, but they were, this was already incubating. It's not they killed Pathos. They were killing, they were already fed up, yeah. and it was incubated from before. Yeah. So they were more implicated. There was a real uh, revolt, and there were 30 soldiers implicated. They were, the 30 of them were taken to Manila to be trial. Mm. So the trial took a while, and after a while, uh, four of them were found guilty, and the other ones were uh, exonerated. The four that were found guilty were brought back to Hagania and uh, put on a fighting squad, and they were uh, executed in 1885, I think. However, and this is what we could maybe make a call for the community, uh, I, I heard from... Um, from um, uh, cultural practitioner Malia Ramirez in, in Guam, that the family of Jose de Salas may have been exiled after the execution, exiled to Saipan. So there may have been a family, or maybe the families of the four executed, Acosta, Mendiola, Agon, and the Los Santos, maybe the four families were exiled to Saipan. Would, 18, late 1890s. Uh, 18, 1885. Oh, a, 1885. A bit earlier. 1885. Okay, yeah. Around that time. They may have been, they may have moved here. Uh, they may have, we don't know if the family will have remembered that because I don't think in those days there was something that they will be um, recording or, yeah, or, or being proud of. Yeah. Maybe they did, and we don't know. Yeah. So, but but if they were, maybe the family carried on memory of that. that mm -hmm. I know of there's a Mr. Ustakio that writes sometimes in the in the Guam newspaper, and and he's a descendant of one of the soldiers that was exonerated. Mm -hmm. But maybe the other four, they had families here. Is there anybody in Saipan that has heard anything of this? Like someone being exiled at tomorrow, exiled from Guam because of killing a governor or or being executed by the Spanish? So if anybody knows anything related to this, you would be interested to hear from them. Indeed. Yes. Carlos, man, this has been great storytelling. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add before you go? 
Well, no, that only that this is great to be here again, that the work of um, on, on the humanities that, that uh, is being done in Saipan, it, it's amazing. And uh, we are looking forward always to for collaborative projects and, and to, to also learn from what you guys are doing, because from Guam, uh, sometimes we think we're far away, but uh, we're really not. So we're not thank you, connected thank you. by ocean. Thank you, and hope to see you again. My pleasure. Our guest today has been Carlos Madrid. He is a professor of Spanish Pacific History and Director of Research at Micronesian Area Research Center at the University of Guam. It's a long title and he well deserves it. This has been your Humanities Half Hour. I'm Katherine Perry. Your Humanities Half Hour has been made possible in part by a major grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Democracy demands wisdom. Any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this program do not necessarily represent those of the National Endowment for the Humanities. For more information or to share your thoughts, contact the Northern Marianas Humanities Council at nmhcouncil.org or on social media at 670 Humanities, that's 670 Humanities. <laughs>